Hey, welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We are an international educational center where we teach people all over the world. Um, we empower the animals in their it, we empower animals and the people that care for them. We do that through our live streaming services. Um, I just got a notification that I went live. Um, we do that through our live streaming services, and you can find out more about that on our website at oops, um, our website, sorry, I'm getting there, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, you can also reach out and get a hold of me um, through my email address, which is Laura, L-A-R-A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, good morning, everybody. Good to see you coming in here. Hey, Tim, I haven't seen you in a while. I don't know if I saw you last week. Sandy, good morning. I will see you in two weeks, Bye. Sandy, at our next um, All Species Animal Training and Behavior Workshop that's happening um, the second weekend in October here at the Animal Behavior Center. We've got a lot of people flying in for it. Um, good morning, Jennifer. Hey, Kramer, Kitty, Ray, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot happening here at the center. I want to update you. Um, good morning, Mark and Carol, um, Kitty. And uh, we've got a lot happening here at the center. Um, I was just thinking this morning. I'm on a countdown, two weeks. <laughs> we have two animals coming here in, a, in probably about a week, and then we have two animals, two more animals coming here that hopefully will be here for a while with us um, for training. So good morning, everybody. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna get you up to date on some of the things that are happening here. Um, if you weren't aware, check your email. We just had a our latest um, email newsletter went out last night um, saying how we must never ask a behavior that we cannot reinforce. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in a presentation I did in Manoa, Ohio, um, where people were asking me, how do I change this behavior? So I'm like, we identify the reinforcer um, and then some of the times deliver that reinforcer for an alternate behavior. So I would ask them, what are your animals reinforcers? And they said, well, I, I don't know. And I said, we can't move towards changing behavior if we don't know, if we have not identified the reinforcers. So that was the topic of my email newsletter list yesterday. And you can find that and sign up for it right here on our Facebook page, uh, right, right there where it says join the email newsletter list. Also on our Facebook page, you can pay attention to the events. Um, on the events page, I will have topics of everybody that I bring on here on Coffee with Critters, um, different events we're speaking at. We have, I probably have four more events to um, present at before the end of the year. And this is my very busy time of the year. Um, if you haven't noticed, we have a new website uh, that's been in the works since February. So take a look at it. Um, it's pretty intensive and we designed our new website based around our online learning programs, our memberships, and our projects. And I can talk about more of that at the end of this live stream because we have a special guest with us on today. I'm getting ready to bring him on, but here is what is going to be happening next week, hopefully. We have Dylan Pickles, the two ringtail lemurs that are getting ready to come to the Animal Behavior Center for training. These are very active animals that can jump very high and very fast. So I work, I've just started working on some focus and control exercises with them. And I am bringing them in in time for us to work with them, all the attendees at our next uh, All Species Animal Training and Behavior Workshop that's going to be given by me and Dr. Deb Jones. So here's a better picture of Dill and Pickles, the lemurs. I'm going to be busy over the next couple of weeks designing the center and an enclosure for them. Okay, and we just finished our zoo workshop a couple of, I think it was two weeks ago, it sold out in one week. Um, we have two more that are already scheduled for next June. Also, you can find on our website a day with the trainer where um, your organization can come in 
uh, people from your organization can come in and work with me side by side. Okay. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Kathy Hahn, Carol, and our manager, Karen Pratt, is on here, Carrie Wentworth. All right, let's get started. Um, I am going to bring on, let me um, go ahead and get Jim Gillis in here from the UK. Hey, Jim, good to see you. Hi, Lara. <laughs> Thanks for coming on today. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so Jim and I were just talking right before I launched uh, this episode of Coffee with the Critters. We have, um, you and I were talking about a couple different topics. Um, as soon as this Coffee with the Critters is over, let's go ahead and um, see if we can get those scheduled because we were talking about um, working with aggression. We sure will. Yeah, and working via consults and um, other people online. Um, so, Jim, this morning, um, let's go ahead. Jim is, why don't you tell us a little about you, Jim, what you do, because you're a certified um, canine behavior consultant and trainer, professional, correct? That's right, yeah, certified dog behavior consultant via IWABC. I've been working with dogs for about seven, going on eight years. I uh, work with a, a national animal welfare charity in the UK as a behaviour officer on our post-adoption support team. And I work with predominantly companion animals um, and their owners with moderate to severe behaviour problems. And do you work with just dogs, Jim? Yes, exclusively with dogs, yes. Okay, okay. great. I know you and I have talked several different times um, about a couple different topics um, and you're very well versed in what you do. Um, so as we get this morning's episode uh, moving, I will tell people, I will show up here, uh, post how people can get a hold of you, your website, your email. Um, so today's topic in Coffee with the Critters is, um, we specifically talked about contra -free, how contra freeloading and foraging are important parts of our behavior modification plans. Correct? Do you incorporate them into almost every behavior modification plan you have? Yes, mostly. It has a wide variety of different applications. You know, it's a natural phenomenon that can be translated into behavior modification plans, uh, particularly where we see uh, problem behavior within dogs, but across species as well. Um, this is something that's appetitive that you will see across all species from you know, rats to, as you know, parrots to uh, pigs to wolves and, and even humans. And it's, uh, you know, an observed behavior where, you know, an organism will, you know, given the choice between having free access to food or working for that food, you know, the animal will choose to work for that food. And that's the importance. I mean, contra freeloading is so important and um, often misunderstood. I think people get contra freeloading and foraging mixed up quite a bit. Um, I know if you some, I think it was Dr. Pat Anderson brought this to my attention. If you Google contra freeloading, um, a picture of the animal behavior center shows up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definition. Um, so contra freeloading, let's start with maybe like the difference between contra freeloading, because a lot of people will the difference between contra freeloading and foraging, a lot of people will see animals foraging and they're like, oh, it's contra freeloading. I'm like, mm, not necessarily. Sure. Yeah. Do we, uh, do you want to start that conversation? Sure. I think it's when, when given the choice, you know, it's a preference test. You know, it's something that an animal will choose to do and work for that food versus what is a natural behavior of foraging and scavenging for food. Uh, within contra freeloading, we see that as a, as a choice you know, a preference um, from the animal's perspective. But there's actually quite a lot going on with contra freeloading. It, it sounds quite simple to be able to work for food, but um, from a behavioral point of view, there's quite a lot going on there that we can take advantage of, particularly in behavior modification plans. Yeah, um, a lot of times here, one of the first things I will do here with any animal that comes in is make sure it is foraging for its food, meaning working for its food um, for several different reasons, because 
a lot of the animals I work with are in enclosures. So their choices are already even more limited sure. than, um, than an animal that has free roam around the center or the house. Um, so foraging, the act of searching and working for food, um, that helps bring in the three C's that I talk about, the choice, the control, the complexity. Um, when they have more items within their enclosure to choose from, it gives them more of a sense of control and helps empower them. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and then contra freeloading. When I talk about contra freeloading, the the difference foraging is searching and working for food. Contra freeloading um, happens when the animal makes that choice to work for the food when it has exact identical food here that it can obtain with less effort. Yes, yet it chooses to take more effort to work for it. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, very succinctly put as well, very much so. And then um, that is, I'm sure you've seen it, Jim, when you're in a training session with an animal and it has free access to the exact type of food um, and it's choosing to work with it, work with you in a training session for it instead. Sure. sure. And we see that across species, you know, in dogs that will choose to work with us where there is no, what we would perceive to be no adaptive value to that, where they have access to food, whether that's lying around on the floor and they make that choice to engage with us um, to, to work for that food. And we see that in dogs and horses and across species. Yeah. So, um, how do you incorporate foraging into your behavior modification plans with some of the cases that you're working working with? And can you give us a specific case um, where you've seen it make a, a big difference? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, foraging, as you identified earlier, is governed under the kind of seeking part of the brain. So dopaminergenic in terms of the way it operates neurologically. So the animals are, you know, kind of, if they are displaying stress-induced behaviors, then foraging can be incorporated into their daily routine, but also as part of behavior modification. And there are really simple ways, and this is what I love about this, it's both evidence-based, a lot of research in this subject, and also easy to implement and relatively cost-effective for owners. So if you have a dog, for example, that is you know, barking for attention whilst people are sitting eating their meal, a really common, behavior issue and of course we've probably rewarded that behavior you know operantly so a dog has learned to access food by barking at their owners well we can provide that that need you know within the dog to access food but in a more appropriate way so we can simulate foraging where we replace that response with something a bit more healthy and they're not doing anything extra they could take that dog's meal and feed it out of a cardboard box where that dog is still accessing food but in a more appropriate way and, and we're kind of rearranging the environment there so that the problem behavior isn't being displayed and we're also meeting that underlying need which is crucial in any behavior modification. Yeah um, when you're sitting here talking about this um, I was picturing um, so the dog is barking and it uh, that barking obviously has been reinforced sure. or it wouldn't be happening but a lot of people, un they don't, because they don't know what to do, um, they give it food. If sure. that's what they're barking for, they give it the reinforcer sure. um, to, they're negatively reinforced. Um, sure. They're escaping, avoiding the consequence, which is barking. So they throw the food to the dog so the dog learns this is what works. Or well, alternatively, it's an extinction burst where the dog has tried strategies previously to access food and is escalating their behavior and, and frustration as an extinction burst. And we can kind of rearrange that as a form of environmental management by still meeting that need and avoiding the need for what we would have been traditionally placed on extinction. I ignore that behavior entirely until it goes away, which can be extremely stressful and frustrating for, for some dogs and unfair on them, in my opinion, because we have rewarded that behavior. So therefore, you know, get meeting that need in a more appropriate way is much more humane and effective in terms of treating that. I love that. I love that. Because <clears throat> a lot of times people ask me, well, I've tried ignoring the behavior and it doesn't work. I'm like, mm. um, if you use extinction and extinction alone, it can 
uh, that is so hard. It can be so hard and frustrating for both the person and the animal. Extremely stressful for both uh, because ignoring and uh, ignoring a behavior alone um, <clears throat> often doesn't work. It's tough. It's tough. And, and some of the advice that we give out to just ignore unwanted behavior, in part, is true, but we need to be more elegant in the way that we deal with that behavior problem and still acknowledging that there is a need driving that behavior. And if we meet the need, it makes our life a lot easier in terms of trying to rectify that as a behavior problem. And I like the, the words you're using, Jim. You just said when you're using extinction, which is also known as ignoring, when you're using extinction alone with an animal that has a, when you have that history of that behavior has been, we've unknowingly reinforced it somewhere in the past, is very unfair for the animal. Totally agree. Yeah, 100%. For sure. Yeah. But, but other examples may be, you know, if you're, if you're working with a very frustrated dog and and you know you maybe you have a dog who's lunging and barking other dogs on on walks then this can be a good way to use foraging in a form of you know as simple as go find it to redirect them away redirect their attention away from something that they are reacting to i will use this as gradual exposure and i'll get a dog foraging but the key point on that is it has to be done under threshold and um, to avoid any complications of emotional conflict and building in uh, any issues being over threshold so what I would say is this is a great um, technique, if you want to call it that, but it's always customized for the individual and it's never a one size fits all. So we have to modify our approach as we see that dog in relation to their threshold. Um, and in some dogs, it can't be under threshold. So for them, this might not be appropriate in terms of being out and about and encountering stressors. You know, um, we want to them to be under threshold and then to reduce that distance over time whilst um, em employing foraging to reduce down some of that frustration and stress-induced behavior. Yeah, um, you're talking um, under threshold. So a lot of times where we find ourselves in situations where we set up uh, ourselves up for failure, hmm. um, a lot of times one of the things I say is so many times we take too big a steps in our shaping plans. Yeah. Um, and so an example of that, you're talking about being over or under threshold. Many people start where the, the dog, the animal is over threshold and you're setting yourself up for failure. Absolutely. And we can go into thresholds, I feel like it's probably a subject that could you could spend hours talking about in and of itself. Um, but, but it is such a key part of particularly behavior modification around something like another dog, for example, or even for things like traffic issues or if, if a dog has issues around unfamiliar people, um, we have to be working under that dog's threshold when we're employing food-based techniques, in my opinion, because then if we don't, we risk that emotional conflict um, and, and that can lead to intermittent anorexia or, or issues that, um, that, that will work against us in, in the future. So it always has to be under that dog's reactivity threshold, if you want to call it that. And it will speed up the process and be much more effective um, in terms of that. Yeah, maybe we have a future topic on over and <laughs> another one. <laughs> another one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down too. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, Jim, I know I get this a lot um, when people tell me, um, "But my animal isn't food motivated." Oh, yeah. So, how do you expect me to teach it to forage? Sure. Um, when it's not food motivated? Sure, great question. And, and foraging is any, you know, it's built in. We could call it a modal action pattern. This is across all species. Um, seeking and acquiring food is probably one of the more primordial systems. You know, it's built into to the species, if you like, in terms of that. If, if, if an animal is not food motivated, then there's likely something else going on. They could be learning that when food appears, there's then a stressor appears and you're, you're seeing that effect in the animal saying, well, I just don't want to eat under these conditions. You could be seeing intermittent anorexia. You know, that could be something that could be over time with those experiences of being over threshold, of worrying about a stressor, and then food being used. That con conflicting emotions of worrying about a stressor versus, you know, the motivation of wanting food. And that those conflicting emotions are really, really delicate. Yeah. Um, wow. This is, this is a fascinating topic to me. Um, a lot of times 
I like what you just said, conditioned reinforcers, conditioned punishers, the behavior of eating or eating from a particular item is paired with an aversive. Yep. Um, so we've unknowingly punished this behavior, yep. um, positively punished this behavior. Yep. So a lot of times I hear people tell me, you know, my animal's not food motivated. I just worked with one two weeks ago in a presentation where an animal was brought out that I had never met before. And they're like, I said, I, I would, you know, do we have a candidate that I can work with so I can show how I begin training, pairing myself with the animal's positive reinforcers. Um, and they brought out this animal and they're like, good luck with that one because it's not mo food motivated. And I'm just like, well, it's live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so some of the places I, I begin when I begin working with an animal is just observation. I don't need to be in that animal's immediate environment. I just want to sit there and watch what is it doing? What isn't it doing? When is it doing certain things? Um, so I can identify reinforcers and punishers uh, or reinforcers and aversives. So and one of the first places I start is with the food dish. What are they eating? What are they eating throughout the day? Um, so, because we're talking about foraging and contra freeloading, um, foraging is a great replacement behavior, like you said, with the dog barking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a lot of motivating operations going on there um, on that individual. Um, but, but I agree with you that they're alive, you know, they are a function species within their environment. So if they're not food motivated, there could be something else going on there. Sure. And sure, uh, rule out anything medical. Yeah, absolutely. First, first protocol. First protocol, yeah. absolutely. But, but it could be, you know, if, if the animal is in fight or flight, you know, if in that, that mode where they're way over threshold, food's just not appealing for adaptive reasons, you know, the digestive system may be switched off if they're in fight or flight and it's not, not prepared to take food or their body's not allowing them to take food. And if that's the case, then that has to be kind of pulled apart for that individual dog in relation to their distant antecedents, where they're at right now as, as, a, as an animal. You know, what's going on around them? Where are they in relation to their threshold for a stressor? Um, and uh, so for those types of dogs, uh, this might not be appropriate. Um, but, but also we need to find what will motivate that dog and where we can work where it will take food and then gradually build it up from there. So foraging and contrafilling is always used in conjunction with a variety of different other techniques that we use but it's always for that individual and customized for that individual. Um, <clears throat> yes, exactly. I mean, s certain cases, more severe cases where I would not incorporate forging is when the animal is so stressed or has a history of reinforcement of being this stressed, um, is not used to change, um, has a lot of abnormal repetitive behaviors, one of the things I'm going to make sure they have free food, as much food um, as they can to be healthy. And then as we continually pair ourselves with the positive reinforcers, then we can start identifying a lot of reinforcers we can work with that are even not even food. Yeah. Yeah. Not food reinforcers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But one of the things we were talking about, um, so say we have a very healthy, active animal that we're working with and the person says, I've tried foraging and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, I mean, if, if, if the subsection of dogs that you're working with, if we kind of exclude the ones at the real problem end, at the real stress end, um, because we have to tailor our approach accordingly for them, but you're kind of standard run of the mill dog who's well socialized, who doesn't have a much, much issues in terms of interacting with the environment, there will still be something else going on there if they don't display a natural drive. And that could be their learning history. So it could be they've just been free fed for most of their life and that working for food actually hasn't been that rewarding for them over time. And to get them to participate in this isn't that rewarding to them because of their history. Yeah. Um like I'm trying to think of dogs as you're talking through a lot of this. When I went to get snow, our deaf and blind border collie, um, we drove, I don't even remember how many hours it was. I don't know, it was like 15, 16 hours to get there. Oh. On the way back, we stayed at a hotel and I already had all of this planned. 
Okay, so here is a dog that cannot see and cannot hear. And my videos started with her immediately. So in the kitchen of this hotel room, um, I brought some of the kibble that she was used to eating. She was 11 weeks old when I picked her up. And I did not feed her in a dish. I just sprinkled it on the kitchen floor. Um, beginning stages of getting the, her searching and using other senses to search, to to obtain food, it, you know, and something else. Like I said before, a lot of times I see people take too big a steps in their shaping plan, mm -hmm. thinking that the animals should understand. Um, so we could start very basic, very with a with the dog is have its food, put some kibble in the food, sprinkle some of the kibble outside the dish. There's a really small step if the dog can see it, if it can't see it, they can smell it and gets them searching for their food. What are some of the steps that you suggest people take with their dogs when? Absolutely. And I love the work you do with Snow. Um, I think it's a great example. Um, yeah. So some of the, um, the kind of troubleshooting issues that I've had around dogs in, in, in Contra Field and is, you know, maybe my, my personal favorite is a cardboard box. So, because it's free, it's super simple to implement. But sometimes it's too much of a um, too much of a big step for some dogs, and, and also particularly around a novel item, we want that initial experience. Whether it's a forage box, a lick mat, you know, anything that we're going to simulate foraging with, we we make sure that that first experience is gradually introduced, and it's a really positive one. I've had dogs tip over the cardboard box and hit themselves on on the face with part of the part of the cardboard box, and just never want to go near it again. You're really nervous dogs that are stretching in they're really worried about it you know that that might not be appropriate for them and maybe have to look at a different type of foraging uh, technique maybe revert to a lick mat for example which is super simple so so yeah there's definitely those gradual approximations of building dogs up and making sure that those early experiences are really positive ones will will set them up for success and just gradually raising the criteria over time and we get that with scent work in the go find it game is making it super simple first of all before raising the criteria and changing context yeah, um, listening to you talking about some of this, um, coming up with different examples and scenarios that have happened here, we're talking about um, foraging and contra-free loading, well, primarily foraging being like a, a replacement behavior, yeah. contra-free loading as well. Let me tell you a situation we had here, and it was turning serious pretty fast. And every behavior serves a purpose. Here at the center, we have numerous different species. Um, this can be a dangerous place for, especially for an animal that can't see or hear. Um, so before we even encounter a situation, I, or I, I, I start training by what situations can we encounter here? Okay, let's start the animal um, learning through training by this. So. What had happened is Snow, our deaf and blind border collie, her, she's um, taught through primarily just touching. So I tell people, don't reach down and touch her because she's probably going to give you a behavior that you don't know that you just cued her to do. And if there's no reinforcer, um, she's going to start barking and spinning. Um, so what was happening here, her, say this is her body. Um, this is her hind quarters. When I squeeze, just one slight squeeze, that means stay where you are. Do not move until I cue you to do something else. Uh, because I plan for that in case um, the pig actually gets accidentally gets out. Mm -hmm. um, the pig is likely to charge her anyways. Um, and she responds well to that. So this is what was happening. We took, she went into the bird room. There's a bird that likes to come down to the bottom of its enclosure. So I'm trying to identify why is it coming down to the bottom of the enclosure? Because that is where snow in this bird can meet beak to nose. Um, the other dogs coming in the room is the reinforcer for this bird coming down to the bottom of the enclosure. Um, so what was happening is snow would go and smell that bird through the bird cage and start barking. Uh, and what I saw was the bird starting to lunge at snow, but snow couldn't see how close it was. So I'm like, snow knew how to stay far enough away. 
but the barking was the reinforcer behind the lunge of the bird and snow feeling that gust of wind from the wing flap was the reinforcer to continue the barking. Wow. <laughs> so I had a situation escalating quickly. So I'm like, all right, I've identified reinforcers for both undesired behaviors. Um, I removed the other two dogs to help prevent the bird from coming down to the bottom of the cage. But I'm like, what? This is simply from the best of my observation from Snow's behavior was lack of enrichment. Mm -hmm. She's finding her own enrichment. This behavior is being reinforced because it's maintaining and increasing. So what we did was I'm like, give her something else to do. So we started sprinkling kibble on the floor at the front of the room. Um, we put, um, uh, like a, a meat spread into a piece of PVC that hangs from the front of the room. Um, so now she is foraging that we're using foraging as a replacement behavior. Give her something else to do. This was lack of enrichment. Absolutely. Great environmental management. And that's what I love about foraging in general is if we can simulate it, then it becomes a form of environmental management. But also it's thoroughly enjoyable from our animal's point of view. So you get that sort of added benefit. And I think when we look at particularly dogs in a domestic setting, we don't necessarily view them as captive animals, but of course they are, and they don't have many choices in, in their life. And if we can just um, get this into their daily routine, i.e. ditch the food bowls entirely, you know, don't waste those opportunities of of using food bowls and, and simulate that foraging, then they will they will benefit overall. There's a lot of studies into their overall state of being increasing their welfare, improving because of foraging being incorporated into their daily routine. And again, that's evidence based. I'm happy to share any links or anything after the, after this after this. Um, but, um, yeah, really good, really good studies on this, which makes them, you know, more positive um, overall. And uh, we had a case recently, just to give you an example of that, or of, of a dog that was flipping his food bowl. So the owners had tried various different food bowls to a slow feeder, and he was still flipping it over. And they couldn't understand why. And of course, that was that any drive to forage. You know, so he's flipping the football over and he's getting to forage and he's fulfilling that need. And of course, viewed by them as a problem behavior, but of course to us it was a natural, natural behavior. So we can incorporate that. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, um, I really enjoy talking to you, Jim. Um likewise. So the flipping of the food bowl, this is interesting. So that could be considered contra free loading, correct? Yeah, absolutely. He's yeah. Eating the food. By himself, you know, yeah. he's like driving that, you know, he's like, I want to forage for this. I don't want it out of a food bowl. I would prefer if it's scattered all over the place. And of course the, the female owner was very kind of uh, very clean, you know, and she didn't want her kitchen floor covered in kibble, which is, I suppose is understandable, but it's interesting the way they viewed that as problem behavior when we explained what was going on there and then met that need in another way, i.e. a cardboard box or simply take it out in your garden and just scatter feed the dog, problem gone, dog's happy, owner's happy, case closed and on you go. You know, it's funny how you said this was a problem behavior for her because she's very clean, whereas if, I'm sure you, I don't know, but if I saw that, I would be like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, totally. This is totally. fabulous. Your dog is telling you, yeah. I want to yeah. work for this. Absolutely. And it's that, maybe that <laughs> lack of stimulation, particularly in a captive environment. And, and I think that's a, that's a hard term for some dog owners to view their dog as captive animals. It is quite a hard thing for them to get over. But when you explain to them that a lot of those frustration, stress-induced behaviours are as a cause of lack of stimulation, that we can we can meet those needs really easy without you know, spending a lot of money or investing a lot of time just through their daily routine of their breakfast and dinner and being not even clever, just meeting those needs, you know, just getting those needs met and you will see problem behavior. What we would perceive to be problem behavior, of course, from a dog's point of view, it's just behavior. Um, but if we can meet those needs, then we see problem behavior and stress and just behavior reduces our consequence. And that's just an example in a domestic setting. If you look at kennels, for example, or whatever, then, you know, there's, there's loads of application for this. Yeah, um, you just said something. Oh, there is a sign that I want painted on the inside of the center. Um, I was actually going to have it painted on the wall that says, we're not messy. We're not messy. We're foraging. 
<laughs> all of that. <laughs> yeah. Love that. Because um, so many times, and I, I see this in a wide variety of shelters for numerous different species of animals that I work with. Just everybody's so focused on the cleanliness, the appearance. I get it. I understand. <clears throat> But um, we, I mean, people come here to the center and say, wow, this place is so clean. We are very clean. We are very in tune with biosecurity. Um, but of the, a lot of times I'll say, skip cleaning that today. Boom, this animal needs trained. It needs mentally stimulated. Get the animal out. We'll clean tomorrow. Um, or we can clean later. Or we can just get parts of this because. Uh, this is like what you were saying. The this is this animal needs mental and physical stimulation, Absolutely. and here at the center, that is one of the top priorities. Um, so wow, where can we go with this now? Um, contra free loading. Okay, so you just gave a great example of contra free loading with the animal flipping with the dog flipping the food bowl. Um, are there any particular instances that you've encountered where when I see an animal contra freeloading, it's like one of the best things I can see. One sure. of the things that gets me the most excited because it's choosing to work for food. Do you have any instances where you've seen this? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, no. So there's some great examples. So do you mean in general, like wanting to do this as in that, that kind of innate need of like really, so you, you can see out and about with dogs that are maybe scavenging off the ground and maybe picking up objects. The only one I would mention on this is the, maybe the, the kind of extreme case of Pika, where, you know, again, that would need, you know, a veterinary professional to look at that dog and do a, a can detailed you explain test. Pika? Pika, yeah, is an abnormal, abnormal ingestive behaviour where dogs will kind of just eat objects um, and, and it needs a medical diagnosis first of all. But if it is, for example, that that dog is just simply the driver for that dog is just about foraging and scavenging, then we can, that the animal is desperate to try and fulfil some of those needs and we can do that for them by, you know, getting them out and about, increasing the quality of their walks by getting them to forage on walks. And I think in modern society, we are, kind of quite assumptive in terms of what our dog's daily needs actually are versus the reality of the situation. So some examples of that would be, you know, maybe an owner that, that, that has a perceived to be a high work and drive dog and they take them out with a ball launcher and for four hours a day they've repetitively thrown a ball for them. Of course, they're creating an athlete of a dog, first of all. That dog's really going to struggle to settle as well in the home. So you're going to see a lot of problem behaviour because of that. So maybe changing that daily routine, changing the quality of those walks by simulating foraging, not even simulating, by getting that dog to forage on walks will increase the quality and reduce down problem behaviour. And I see this a lot with, you know, examples of like Hungarian Vizslas that just can't settle in a home because they're so amped. They've got that adrenaline coursing through their body. And the owners are misinterpreting where the problem, the, the origin of the problem is coming from. So when we tweak that dog's daily routine to incorporate foraging, then things just get better because it's relaxing. It, I would say it's parasympathetic because it's part of that mechanism of, you know, I'm, I'm not just in like that mode when I'm going after things. Like, for example, you know, chasing and catching a ball repetitively, you know, is an acting part of that uh, predatory sequence, but it's never fulfilling the sequence. So you're just about chase and catch and retrieval, but you're not then, you know, kill, dissect. So you maybe see some of that problem behavior manifest itself in a home with a dog that will come home and strip tennis balls and they'll chew and destroy things and they'll rag their bed. And a lot of that is that kind of desire to complete that cycle, but also a lot of frustration in there because natural behavior has been thwarted. So what I love about foraging is that we can, yes, we can play the high arousal activities with our, with our dogs and, and certainly don't phase this entirely out of their daily routine, but incorporate some of the low arousal activities at the end of it and you'll find the dogs will benefit massively from it. Yeah, <clears throat> great, great example. Um, with you saying that, and I see Joanna Camburn just mentioned a comment about her pig. She says, not until I owned a pig and had to consistently provide stimulation and training to her did I realize how much every animal needs it. Changed my perspective completely. Yeah. Um, with you talking about these different um uh, types of dogs, people, and I know this is a common problem, people, oh, I've always wanted a 
border collie because they're so smart. I have never wanted a border collie. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a deaf and blind yeah. one. I yeah. was telling people mm, the, the more intelligent, but how do you, then it comes into how to define, how do you define intelligent to harder sure. to keep? Sure. Um, so with you talking about these um, different types of dogs, working dogs, hunting dogs, people get these, I've always wanted a rat terrier. I haven't, but if you yeah. want to get a certain type of dog, please do your research and know, you know, the natural behaviors of that dog. Because Absolutely. You bring that border collie into your house with um, just a ball to play with and a couple of toys on the ground. You're going to be Frustration. Oh, yeah. yeah. All over the place. So I have a case just now of two border collies. And, and if I was to say this case to you previously, you'd probably say it was a border collie, but light and shadow chasing and, and lots of repetitive wall licking. You know, and it's just chronic lack of stimulation. Um, and the, it's not even that, I wouldn't say the conditions are that bad, the, the problem behaviors come as a consequence. It's just a daily routine. It's too much high arousal stuff in terms of out in the garden, chasing things, and not enough of meeting the needs in another way. Um, but particularly for, and this is a great example actually of the wall licking, where we can use we can use a form of contra free loading to maybe provide a solution to that problem in terms of still meeting the need you know, without blocking or preventing the dog, which could be extremely stressful. And sure. as you as you and I know about abnormal repetitive behavior, if it doesn't have that outlet, it will manifest itself in, in other ways. Um, so if we simply block the dog from, from licking the wall, then we could create problem behavior as a consequence of that. Whereas like a lick mat might be a really elegant solution, super simple, you know, redirect the dog onto the lick mat, interrupt and redirect, um, and it will still meet the need whilst increasing mental stimulation um, in, in combination. And, and that will, if we do that properly, that should have a big effect on that dog. Yeah. Um, hmm. So I'm just thinking, I'm writing, I'm taking all kinds of uh, notes here. Uh, for example, a lot of times people bring in, in the world of exotics and difference, people want these animals because they're different. Yeah. Um, they're pretty, um, or like the world of pigs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about there in the UK, Jim. Are people getting pigs as pets? I haven't seen many. I've got to be honest. Okay. Um, a lot of times they want to bring this pig in because it's different, but then they bring the pig in. They think it's different and like a dog. It is different, a lot different than a dog. They'll bring it in and then they want to change natural behaviors because this doesn't fit in their household. I'm sure you see this with dogs as well. All the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. How do I change this behavior? Well, enjoy enjoy your dog. <laughs> exactly. And actually the thwarting of some of those natural behaviors can be extremely frustrating and confusing for them as well. And they don't understand. And it's our duty of care to make sure that Anything we're doing with them in terms of behavior change is humane and we're factoring in their needs. Um, yeah, I was going to tell you there's one example of contra freeloading that I have, and I actually have it on recording. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I hate telling people what species of animal I'm working with because they're, they'll be like, well, it only happens with that species. No, this is something that can happen across the board. I was working with a pigtailed macaque and I'm sitting, I've got the camera behind me and this is a resource guarding pigtailed macaque. It's a primate that anything in its cage within two feet outside of its cage, it is that macaque. <laughs> and if you try to go over and pick it up, um, you're going to see some behaviors that are probably going to scare you. Um, so I was working on, um, changing behavior, getting him to go pick up things in his enclosure and hand it to me. And I'm sitting there working with him with Cheerios as my reinforcer. And I'm giving him one Cheerio at a time. And sometimes I would give him a handful of Cheerios based on what behaviors he was giving me. In the background is where the visitors come up, um, the visitors of the zoo come up and they can 
purchase a handful of Cheerios to put in a bucket for this macaque to pull towards enclosure. So these people, and I'm watching these people over this macaque shoulder and I'm sitting here working with the macaque and they put their 25 cents in. So that sound of the 25 cents is a conditioned reinforcer for the macaque to turn and say, 25 Cheerios are coming. <laughs> you know I mean? And I'm sitting there working with the cac, and I only have one. You know what I mean? So I'm at this point, I'm interested. Are you going to abandon my training and go get food at less effort, a much more amount? Or are you going to stay here because I'm only going to continue to give you one Cheerio? And so I'm watching these people and I was like, this will be really interesting. I should end the training session because that's why people come to the zoo is to see um, the animals. But I kept the training session going and um, they put the 25 cents in, grabbed that handful, threw it in the bucket. The macaque turned, looked and sat and waited for the next week. You know, <laughs> The, the next cue for me to do and the hair rose on all my arm because so much is happening there you yeah. know and yeah. this was an animal i was extremely fearful of mm -hmm. i did not want to work with because i didn't understand him and this is an animal that is probably now one of my favorite animals to work with at this particular zoo because now i understand him he understands me and it's a relationship we've built through training and Wonderful. for him to abandon all that food and stay here what is happening here great example and, yeah great yeah. example of that. so um anyways some of our toughest cases jim i'm sure are our best teachers absolutely absolutely and we have to view it as opportunities as well but, but i get that as well and you know, sometimes it is, it is challenging when you don't have that relationship already with a, with an animal that has a history of aggression, you know, and we're all human from that perspective. And but once you build that trust and rapport, I had it um, on, on, on Thursday where I was working with a very fearful and nervous Jack Russell who's been a, had a really turbulent past, I think Romanian street dog through to the UK and being rehomed and the stress of that journey and being rehomed and the, the distant antecedents in that dog's history were really causing so many problem behavior in terms of perception and um and then on thursday for the first time she trusted me and she came over and wanted petted and and uh you know it's it's, it's an amazing relationship we can build with our animals but definitely it can be difficult in those first initial you kind know, of phases yeah um with you saying that a lot of times i'll tell people um uh, if i'm lucky i have food to work with yeah if i'm if i if i'm lucky um, there's a lot of times in some of these severe cases, as you have as well, food is not going to work. Yeah. Um, but one thing um, I do say a lot is some of the animals I work with, food is the only thing I can provide. And I'm thinking in my head, working with injured wildlife that can no longer go back out into the wild. This is an animal that is not raised around humans. Um, it's learned through its history to stay as far away from them as possible. And now here you are in captivity and you're being flooded with people every day, cleaning your enclosure, giving you food, changing your water. Um, and this, it, it's amazing to see. So a lot of times food with those particular animals are, is the only thing I have to work with because they are not going to work for head scratch. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Actually, actually, that dog I mentioned was food refusing pretty much consistently for the first couple of weeks following rehome. Really? Um, yeah, really difficult. So it was a very gradual desensitization program, generalized fear of men um, as well. So I think that's sometimes a difficulty. Um, practicing as a male is there's quite commonly a generalized fear of men. And, and the fact that that dog's food refusing, you're so then limited in terms of your interactions, in terms of building a relationship with that dog, is bringing things to the table which that animal finds reinforcing is going to be quite difficult because of you know that food refusal. So if you're relying on non-food um, reinforcers, it's going to be it's going to be challenging. 
Um, you know, particularly when the dog doesn't want to play and is fearful for their survival as an in vigilance mode. And that's a really challenging place to be. Um, and, and the only thing then is to, is to rely on gradual desensitisation um, and, and build it up with the hope that it's enough to get you past that that fear, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, advancing in these more severe cases, um, then you see once you can get to that point for working with food, you've had some type of breakthrough. But a lot of times what I see after that, Jim, is exactly what you're talking about. The animal will choose to work with you for the opportunity to be with you. Yeah, which is lovely when you think about it. It really is. It's a very special moment, that. And that's probably one of the distant reinforcers that keeps us doing what we're doing. Sure. Yeah, um, that's that's amazing. And I'm sitting here thinking, listening to you talk about several different issues. Would you uh, I would love to have you come in our level two membership and talk, do a, a live presentation. Um, Absolutely. Our, our level two membership is primarily uh, but not all professional animal trainers uh, where we can uh, people that are we have BCBAs and their board certified behavior analysts and uh, people who are thinking about getting into the field. This way we can dive really deep into some of these topics. Love to. Okay. Yeah, love um, if you had one piece of advice to give people, I'm really putting you on the spot. And so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Laura. <laughs> uh, sure. Thanks the food bowls. Get them out of the equation. Don't waste Ditch those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, get, get them out of the equation and, you know, meet your dog's needs and you'll see problem behavior reduce, what you would perceive to be problem behavior. You'll see a reduction in stress-induced behavior, frustration elicited behavior. Um, just by that one change alone, and if that's any takeaway that, that I can get through, then then absolutely my one recommendation, get the food bowls out of the equation. Good. So when you ditch the food bowls, Watch what they're doing. Watch how they're behaving. Watch when the tail is wagging, what yeah. the ears look like, um, the eyes look like when they're doing this behavior on their own. You will start to learn much more about that individual animal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love nothing more than seeing a dog rooting about in a cardboard box filled with kitchen roll tubes and Kongs and having an enrichment box. And that dog's just loving life in there. And, and afterwards, they're relaxed, they're settled. And, and I think that people will see a benefit from this in, in, in problem behavior. I think a lot of people don't understand the behavior they're, they're seeing. A lot of people don't understand what stress looks like. Yeah, exactly. There's so many examples of that where we're anthropomorphizing and we're looking at the, the behavior the dog is displaying and misinterpreting it and therefore coming at it from a completely different angle. And when we actually understand what's going on, we can really meet the needs of our dogs in a way that's appropriate to them. And that's really a good takeaway from it. Yeah. Um, so Adrian just says something. We've been getting so many comments, Jim. She says this was an awesome live stream, some good learning this morning, new stuff plus refreshers for older stuff. Um, yeah. So, I mean, here, when we are not training, because um, a lot of our training can be forms of contra freeloading. The animal, um, when I'm feeding breakfast here in the morning, which I'm getting ready to do as soon as this live stream's done, it usually takes me four hours to feed breakfast because wow. training so many numerous animals for their breakfast. And a lot of times I will try giving the exact same food at less effort in their dish but yet you see animals continue to go to their stations. And that is a big communication tool. Uh, that is a, a big form of communication. This animal is asking to be trained. Absolutely, maybe you've got a dog that, you know, just isn't eating well, you know, and it's maybe that they are just simply bored eating out of a food bowl. And if you make that change, I would always recommend investigation um, from a medical point of view for, for any cases like that. And it's always an individual basis. But if you have a dog that's in good health and they're really not that bothered about, you you don't get the food bowl, they don't run through with enthusiasm when they're quite lethargic around the food bowl and feeding times, then 
um, you know, maybe change the way that you're feeding them and you'll see an uplift in their perception and overall mood, if you, if you like. Yeah. Um, and some, ex some extra little points on contra freeloading before we end, Jim. Um, I know there's some studies out there that I've read and um, one of them says that the hungrier the animal, the less likely to contra freeload. Absolutely. But once yeah. they satiate on food about 50%, then you'll yeah. switch, see it start. We've read the same study. <laughs> yeah, we've read the same study. It was actually where I put a section where this might not be appropriate. And that motivating operation, you know, that hunger in there might be something that will affect that individual's perception of working for food. So that's a really good point that you make. Yeah, um, I have it on video. And if I remember, I'll make my, let's just say Kronos. I have it on video where um, I was giving free food and then I gave food for the crow, it was an African pied crow, to work for. It went to the food dish and I was like, oh. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> because it backed up the 50% satiation um, part of that study where I watched it go eat and then boom, jumped to the floor and started working for the same type of food. And Great I was example. Like, yeah, great example. So when we're done, I will try to find that video and post it. Um, so, Jim, we're getting a lot of comments and a lot of compliments from a lot of the attendees uh, here today. Um, so once we end this or sometime within the next 24 hours, feel free to go back and um, respond. There's some questions in there that I couldn't I couldn't grab them all. They were going by too fast. Sure. So, Jim, um, I have here, if people want to learn more about what you do and follow you, because you also have a Facebook page. I was on there the other day. Yeah, um, I do. Yeah. Um, so what is, if people want to go to your website, it's cbtdogbehavior.com, spelled differently than it is here in the States. Um, yeah, and then if people want to email you, mm -hmm. um, they can get in touch with you at CBD, CBT. Please feel free to do so. Yeah, feel free to do so. Okay. And um, also, go take a look at your Facebook page, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Lots of interesting things on there. Yeah, I will um, be following your Facebook page. Jim, I want to thank you so much for coming on with me today. Welcome. This went pretty fast. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, and so throughout the conversation, go fast. <laughs> throughout the conversation, I've written down a bunch of things that we could. I can bring you back here on um, Coffee with the Critters. I'm going to okay. get in with you today, today to see if you'd be a guest in the level two talking about particular topics. Love to as well. Okay, if you want to hang with me, instead of putting you in the lobby, I will just go ahead and bring the photos back up here. So a lot of people are familiar with the work that we do. Um, this is a lot of what we do in our level one and level two membership programs. Um, a lot of the work that I do is online live streaming. And we do that through our level one and level two membership. Level one is companion animal owners. Level two is what I've already said. Um, it's more for people thinking about getting in the field and people interested in applied animal behavior, applied behavior analysis. This is really tiny <laughs> with the two of us still staying on here. But we also have online learning that is in the form of species specific. So we have the deaf dog project, the parrot project, the pig project, and the snow project. Uh, we have a referral program for every five people that you refer to our memberships or projects and that sign up, um, I will give a free online behavior consultation. And working online is something Jim and I were talking about before we went live. Um, in two weeks from today, we will be in the middle of our second all species animal training and behavior workshop um, with given by myself and Dr. Deb Jones. We have people flying in from all over the United States for this. There are a couple seats left and um, that's what Dylan Pickles and Lemurs are coming in. That's not the only reason they're coming in. C4AW event, second weekend in November. Come see us in Chicago, Illinois. This is amazing collaboration of people with all aspects of avian wellness from nutrition, enrichment, um, learning, training, 
and uh, and more. That's the second weekend in November. Next June, because our our zoo workshops, our zoo workshop sold out so fast and was such a hit. I've got two more dates designed right now. Um, dates picked, and um, you can contact me at my email address or through our website if you want more information. And next September, in a year, um, I'll be speaking at second time speaking at the PPG Summit and Workshops out at Best Friends Animal Society in Kanab, Utah. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for attending, and um, we'll follow up with you. Jim and I will as soon as we end this session of Coffee with the Critters. All right? Jim, thanks again so much. Pleasure. Thanks, Lada.